on the previous episode of History Bubble, Ahmad Saad Durrani created what we now know as Afghanistan. The treaty was signed, and Afghanistan was now a British puppet. Amnullah had gained independence from the British. After independence, Amnullah wanted to westernize Afghanistan and gain better foreign relations. He also introduced many reforms to the country, mainly more rights for women, better education, more freedom of speech and secularization. But this wasn't liked by some of the religious leaders in the country, so they rose up in rebellion. The Coast Rebellion, as it was called, was defeated, but it halted many of the Nullah's reforms and it made a new threat arise. Many people followed the Coast Rebellion's example and went against Amnullah. The Shahiri tribe, a chieftain led by a man named Habibullah, attacked Kabul at that time. Many of Kabul's defenders deserted and Amnullah lost hope and abdicated the throne, leaving it for a brother. But after only two days of rule, Amnullah's brother abdicated the throne to Habibullah, stating that he never wanted to be a king. This is my biggest what if of Afghan history. What if Amnullah never abdicated the throne and defeated the rebels after that? Would Afghanistan westernize and secularize? I think it may even be unlikely for the Taliban to rise. This is because Amnullah had made good relations with the Soviets and they would not be likely to attack and start the rebellion of the Taliban later. But like all what if of history, we will simply never know. The rebel leader, Habibullah, was overthrown and killed by Amnullah's cousin that was named Muhammad Nadir. He abolished most of Amnullah's reform and spent most of his reign suppressing minor rebellions. After Nadir's death his son Sahir took over but it was mostly named it was actually his uncles who did most of the work like increasing trade with nations like Japan and Germany. During the Second World War, Afghanistan stayed neutral. After the war, Sahir saw the need for modernization and started to get more involved with politics. In 1963, he started to rule independently, and a year later, a constitution was signed, making the country move gradually into democracy. But when Sahir was on a vacation in Italy, a coup took place by a man named Mohammed Daud. Khan, establishing a one-party republic that never had an election, so it wasn't really a republic. Anyways, Sahir did not want a civil war, so he abdicated, but the new government was not well liked and the country soon became unstable. The Soviet relations also decreased, because they were not very really well liked and most likely Soviet intervention. The People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan rose to popularity and power and in 1978, Sao Revolution took place. It was to make the PDP come to power, and it did, overthrowing killing Daud. As the PDP grew in power, they became more and more Stalinist, and started making religion ban and killing the previous elite. The amount of people killed during these first years of PDP rule is estimated to be around 15,000 people. As you can guess, this was not well liked and soon, as any influential person started rallying to overthrow the government, people flooded to them. This led to the rebels called the Afghan Muraydan not being a unified group but having many leaders. Most notable of these were Yamalt-e-Islami by Burhabuddin Rabini and Hesab-e-Islami led by Gulbuddin Ekmaitar. Just to clarify, a Muaydan is someone fighting a jihad or holy war, and that was what the rebels thought they were doing. Many people started to join one of these rebel groups. Even half of the Afghan army deserted, some joining one of these groups. Just to get it in there, this was the start of the war we still do today in Afghanistan, making it the longest ongoing conflict that still takes over a thousand deaths a year. So. Back to the story, the Soviets were in alliance with the PDP, so they had to join the war on their side. The Soviets came fast, with a hundred thousand men taking much of northern Afghanistan, but this only made the situation even worse for them. Because many of these parts where the Soviets occupied, the rebels wanted to free the city from them and join the rebels. The Soviets had tanks, airplanes and helicopters, equipment not widely seen in the Muaydan ranks. 
So the Soviet could easily win over the poorly organized rebels. At first, the Soviets and PDP soon controlled most of the country's major cities. But most of the ruler areas were under Mehidin control. The Mehidin mostly used guerrilla tactics, sending out small groups of fighters to attack and harass the Soviet forces. Because the Soviet army was la much larger than them and they could easily harass them by sending out small attack team. And Pakistan also started to aid the Mehidin at this time, making the areas close to the Pakistani border having much more Mehidin control than the rest of the country. Soviets never thought the war would last as long as it did, because even when they defeated so many Mehidin, they still got so many new recruits every day since they did not like the Soviets or PDP. Even the forces fighting for the PDP and thus the Soviets were mostly there for the money and morale was low. This made the Soviets and PDP try new tactics for war such as burning villages to dry out Mehidin supplies. But this only led to a stronger hatred towards them and thus more Mehidin. Another thing they did was to make Afghan troops go under cover to into the Mehidin ranks. Other nations started to aid the Mehidin, like the US and Saudi Arabia. Mehidin was now not only limited to Afghans, and Muslims from all over the world came to join them in their fight against the Soviets and PDP. Most notably of these people joining them was a Saudi Arabian man named Sama Bin Laden, and by 1987 the Mujahideen were assumed to have 4000 bases of operations in Afghanistan. The war was now too much of a burden for the Soviets to fight, so they withdrew, leaving the PDP to their own defenses. The Soviets still supported the PDP, but not with troops, and they were now destined to lose almost. But to the surprise of many, they still won a battle at Yibolt, and most of the country was now under Mehidin control, and in 1932 they had won. And so the Peace War record was signed, dividing power between the Mehidin leaders. This did not please many of the Mehidin leaders who saw themselves to lead the country. So they did what they did best and went to war against the others. The first one to do so was Gulbuddin Hekmaitar of Ezab e Islami. He sent his troops forward to attack Kabul, and in Kabul, chaos erupted as Gulbuddin released all prisoners of the city prison. Many of these prisoners joined Gulbuddin, but others spread havoc in the city. They were eventually driven out by the Afghan government, but still, they had caused much damage to the city. But Gulbuddin still continued fighting by bombarding the city with artillery. Fighting had also begun between Gulbuddin and another faction called Yumbish in Middle. Gulbuddin also started to take the attack more as a siege, cutting power lines and food supply. Another faction, Hezabi Wadat, led by a man named Abdur, left the government and aligned himself with Gulbuddin. Later, Dostum of Yumbish Mili did the same. Now the government was weaker, facing a larger threat and making the rebels take parts of the city. Both sides committed many atrocities as power shifted, as the soldiers knew they would not get punished for the war crimes they committed during this time. The population of Kabul at this time was now only a quarter of what it has been before the war. Well that's it for today, see you in part 3.